I'm Richard Grayson. I work as an artist, as a curator and a writer and um, I'm here to curate and bring together the Adelaide International Exhibition for 2014. I used to be the director of the um, Experimental Art Foundation in Adelaide, a place dedicated to the slightly wilder shores of experimental visual arts practice and then after that I um, I had the uh, interesting experience, the genuinely interesting experience, of uh, being the curator of the 2002 Sydney Biennale. And then after that, I washed up in Berlin for a few years, where I returned uh, to a focus on making my own work. And since then, I've uh, made projects both as a curator and as a visual artist. The thing about art that I'm really interested in is actually the bit which just lies on the on the edge, really, of the sort of the rational bit of it. The way that art operates is a space for us to sort of make hypothetical guesses, leaps into the dark, where you're actually doing something that you don't quite understand what's happening there. And I don't mean that necessarily as in that romantic sort of, oh, I'm mad me, I'm an artist. I mean it more in that thing of it's a place where we as individuals and we as a society and we as a culture can variously sort of push the model, push the way that we might imagine how we might see the world and understand what happens to us. I mean, what I find intriguing about the, whatever, we, whatever this thing called art is, is that as a species we've been doing something that looks like it for an awful long period of time, even if we haven't necessarily called it art. So this is just like a contemporary expression of something that our nervous system has been doing ever since we sort of went bipedal and got language. The bit that really fascinates me about art is the bit you can't quite talk about. That, that edge, you know, what the hell is this? Each one of these events that you're going to go into are going to take you into a sort of world, into a slightly different world. You're going to experience either a, a biggish body of work by somebody that describes the world that that artist is mapping or describing or the edge that they're trying to push and then you're going to leave there then you're going to sort of walk into another world so hopefully it's going to be a series of immersive um, experiences everywhere I've gone in my life I have carried books. I'm Laura Croach and I'm the director of Adelaide Writers Week. I was a really lucky kid. I grew up in a house full of books. For me, me as a reader began with a little beer book. I was four years old and I can remember exactly the evening when all of a sudden the symbols became words and I've never looked back. The first thing I do in a hotel is put books down. The first thing anywhere I do, and they are, they're my comfort. They're an answer. They're a place that you can go. They are, they give you solace, they give you joy. And yeah, I can't, I can't imagine a world in which if someone took all the books away, I just wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> I'd be utterly lost. You know, one of the things I've found really interesting in the last, you know, when I was young, in meaning a teenager, and in my early 20s, it was South American literature, you know, opened this whole world, and so many of us are defined by writers like Borges and A Hundred Years of Solitude, and what that meant. Well, you know, now we see this coming out of Africa, and there's this extraordinary literature that's beginning. Um, and part of that is a result of the end of civil wars, because you do need peace, unfortunately, for literacy, you know, they do tend to go together. But part of what we're seeing is the birth of a new literature. And that literature is also already a diaspora literature. So you're watching an African literature coming out of Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, and Europe, all at the same time in the United States. So I feel, I feel optimistic. You know, I feel like Shakespeare will always be there. But, you know, I really want to know, I want to know about the rest of the world. I mean, Chinese literature, we don't even know yet. Those of us, obviously, who don't speak Mandarin or can't read um, Chinese characters. And I just think it's exciting, you know? Slowly, Japanese literature is becoming into more, there's more translations. And I'm like, great, there's more than Murakami. There's lots of stuff. So I think it's an exciting time. Reading is, to, to my mind, as creative an act as writing. 
Literally, words have to be read in order to come alive. A book without a reader is typing. It's typeset. It's beautiful. It's an object to be admired. But I need to imagine what you imagined in my own way in order for it to exist. There's nothing ever passive about reading, and it requires creativity, and it requires energy. So I think it's really important that we always remember that we need more readers than writers. <laughs> it's as simple as that. But we also need to value the creativity that every reader brings to every book. Writers' Weeks are significant in lots of ways. Because the industry is struggling right now, we're filling a bit of a gap. We are still a growth industry, and writers still want to meet readers, and readers want to meet writers. And as marketing budgets shrink, we are able to do some of what publishers used to do. The program that we create becomes a guide. So there's all this noise in the world. There's all these books and bookshops. And we're at the beginning of that journey. So you pick it up. And I suspect even if you never come to Writer's Week, I mean, I read programs from festivals all over the world. You'll still be getting ideas about books you may want to read. Um, if you do come, which is better for us, you'll get a sense of the writer and the writing. And that's why it's always important to us to get a little reading, get a lot of conversation, and get some questions in. Writers Weeks offer a unique place for young and emerging writers to find an audience. And it's been a great privilege for me to bring first and second book writers to the festival. Because it's hard. The review pages are shrinking. They're the internet is loud and noisy. And one of the things we say as directors and as organizations is we say, this is a good book. We recommend you read it. And we use the faith that many years, this event is now almost 54 years old, that kind of the trust of our brand, which sounds wanky, but it isn't, the trust you have in us, we can then give to young writers. And we can give to writers you may have never heard of. Um, and it's, I think it's a really important thing My name is David Sefton. I'm the Artistic Director of the Adelaide Festival. I remember being taken by the school to the Liverpool Philharmonic Hall to see uh, the tales of Beatrix Potter with a live orchestra. So the film and orchestra thing has kind of been in my background for quite a long time. I must have been about eight then. Uh, and I've always, because I, I sang in the school choir, I played the violin from the age of nine. Um, I was in the cathedral choir and the church choir. Uh, and I've just, it's what I've always done because I've just never done anything else. And so my, my life has been a succession of interactions and relationships to the arts in one form or another. Even then, it was definitely a mix because I was playing lead second violin in the Merseyside Youth Orchestra and I was the lead singer in a punk rock band. So it kind of, that, that I suppose if you could characterize it as anything, it's that fact that it's always been a, a range of different things that I've got a range of different things out of. I guess I've all, and, I, and by that point, of course, I was going out to gigs and I was going to see a lot of bands, but I was also going to concerts and by that point, theater as well. So I've always, I've always got out of it a lot of different things from, from a lot of different art forms, I suppose. No, I definitely couldn't work in accounting. Um, I've always done something related to the arts. I started out as an arts journalist. I started my own arts publication. I then went into working in theatre. I then was working in music. So I, I, I don't think, at, at this point, I think it's too late to retrain into a proper job. I think I am actually incapable of doing anything that isn't fundamentally arts-based. You can only have civilization with the presence of the arts. I think you can have, you can have the world, but I think in terms of a, a world without culture is, a, is not civilization. It's, it is the civilizing medium of society. And it, it excites, it energizes, it communicates, it educates, it illustrates, it, it emotes. Culture can do all of those things that, that just talking can't. And, and whether that's music, or whether that's books, or whether that's film, or whether that's theater or dance, that, that all of those things are, are achievable through the media of all the different cultures that, that we showcase in the festival.
the Adelaide Festival has always taken chances. It has always been known on this continent as the festival that is the first to do things and the ambitious one and the bold one. And that's what's so exciting for me and clearly for the audience about the Adelaide Festival is that there is a license in that context to be able to take risks. And as an artistic director and as a programmer, that's what you want. You want an audience that will say, what's the new thing that we haven't heard of before that is going to excite us? What's the thing that's going to shock us? I, f I feel like the, what the Adelaide Festival provides pretty much uniquely uh, to Australia, I think, is this history of risk taking. I, I mean, obviously, the, there is an expectation that there will be this mix of art forms, which is absolutely fine, and that's what you want. I, I feel like in terms of what I did last year and what I'm doing with the festival we're about to launch is um, certainly providing the context to mix up, for example, the music program and do things that have not been necessarily in the festival before. That, that what you are doing is you're providing a logical context to put something into a festival program which wouldn't be here otherwise, which is not touring, which is not just, oh, well, well if the festival wasn't here, this would be. And, and addressing things like electronic music in the way that we would address theatre or dance and providing the, the most fantastic, the, the, the cream of the crop in terms of what's brand new, what's influential, what's had, a, had an impact or is having an impact. And I, I feel I take a similar approach to all the art forms. I'm looking for those things as, as much in the contemporary dance program as I am in the contemporary music program, as I am in the theatre program. It's to, it's to move the game along, it's to, to showcase innovation and excellence, it's to, it's to show things that I find exciting and inspiring uh, and put them up there and go, this is the best in the world, this is, this is what's happening right now, this is what's out there that everyone's getting excited about and show it to the audience here. You know, Obviously technology has had a huge impact already on the arts and that's a conversation that, although it continues, has been happening for 20 years. So you can't really talk about technology as being what's going to impact the arts in the future because it already has. I don't know what the next one's going to be. I feel like um, the, the experiencing of live arts gets more important with the fewer opportunities to mix. I feel like it becomes the village pump. The idea of where you, the, the, this being the place where you get together and have a shared experience. I feel that's only got more important. I mean, the, the great predictions of the past 20 years that it would be the death of the concert hall because you could experience all this stuff at home and online. I don't think that's true. I think if anything, the live experience becomes a more important part. And you've only got to look at all the concert halls still being built around the world. It's the classic thing that the ownership of first video and then DVD players increased the frequency of people going to cinemas rather than decreasing. And I feel like the multi multiplicity of formats in which you can experience things on your own makes people more inclined to want to go out and share those things with other people. Look, I feel like what I'm doing is continuing a, a, an honourable tradition of a festival that is allowed to be, you know, a little bit redefined, that allows itself and, and in, a, in a very real sense, that should be the point of changing directors every four years, is that I'm going to bring to it my own take on what it should be. And that means it will always have that background of a mix of new music and what I regard to be the very best in contemporary dance. When I sit in a theatre and go, I have never seen anything like this before and I think it's fantastic. That's what I'm, that's the experience I am looking for. And that's the experience I want to share with the audiences and go, you really have to see this. I mean, they really have to see Roman tragedies. You should not miss, it's one of the best nights I've ever spent in a theater in my life. So I, what I'm doing is going, Trust me, you will like this. And I'm excited about Richard's visual arts program and Nick's visual arts program. And I think it's great to have such a top line visual arts curators coming in and inputting work at the same kind of standard in galleries that we're putting into theatres and concert halls. Similarly with Laura, that's right up, up to the moment of what's going on in, in, the, in the written word. I mean, they, you know, we have the youngest ever Booker Prize winner who we, we had before she won the prize.
rise. And it's so it's absolutely of the moment. There's a lot of new work in there, a lot of new names. So it's brilliant to have to have such a kind of consistently fresh approach to the whole festival.